Uh, I'm just going to tease out a few of uh, the main takeaways from the four presentations. I, I think that there are really two main levels of analysis here uh, that speak directly to the question of social awareness. Uh, and certainly there's the internal dimension. The first two presentations related more to the internal dimension. How diverse organizations lead to more optimal decision making. And certainly that has been established in the scientific literature. Um, diversity is a mechanism through which biases can be challenged and it's a way to destroy these eco-chambers, uh, which were referred to in several other presentations. And here I find the, the logic compelling and, and the science sound. And uh, the strategy that has been laid down, I think, is, is fairly easy to, um, to follow, though it might not be fast to change. Um, I'm more troubled by Dr. Wong's presentation. Of course, it's kind of a call to action, uh, which really resonated with me. Uh, but it's true that there are going to be major demographic shifts, which are going to challenge organizations. Uh, and that adaptation can impact performance. So looking at millennials, for instance, as that uh, particular uh, group that is part of the new recruitment pool, um, there are a number of challenges there in, in, in how society might be enabling a risk-averse predisposition is especially troubling, and then uh, perhaps suppressing leadership instincts, uh, which, which is quite severe. Uh, next, we have the external dimension. Uh, the question of uh, gender in operations. And I was particularly struck over the years of uh, work from scholars like Mia Bloom who look at female terrorists and how adversaries have managed to exploit gender-based biases. Um, Daesh only, I don't think they've taken the GBA plus training to know that when uh, instances of female terrorists occur, um, there is eight times more media coverage. You can't buy that kind of publicity. Uh, so the way that adversaries now are positioning themselves, making, doing that gender-based analysis and using it to their own advantage, I think is usually important to recognize in operational planning and missions. Similarly, Russian information operations in the Baltics, much like uh, they did in the Ukraine and Crimea, take a very sophisticated approach to understanding how the message might differ for the women they're targeting versus the men that they're targeting. So uh, thank you, Darlene, for bringing that aspect to the fore. And finally, cultural awareness. I think that um, that's been especially um, salient in the past decade and a half. I mean, you can either learn the hard way, which is going to an unfamiliar place and having you know, friction between your own culture and the culture that you're exposed to, or, or you can tap into uh, the, the social science that's out there and that, that may be um, available to inform the strategies. Of course, how that's rolled out is, is the rub, uh, because that interaction between the world of social science and regional experts and you know, the operational community, um, I don't think there's really a mechanism for that to happen uh, effectively yet, but that is certainly a mechanism through which uh, performance can be enhanced and certainly lessons can be incorporated uh, quicker. Hello, I'm uh, Major Lindsay Reinelt. I'm the Chief Instructor at the Peace Support Training Center. Uh, so interestingly enough, I was in Congo in 2001 when they rolled out 1325. I was actually working in the training section there and I was given the train the trainer package by the uh, civilian folks that came out to had developed it and put it into place. And uh, so I got to roll that out for the first time in front, of, in front of a bunch of military observers who were actually going out to the jungle, and it did not resonate. The, the language didn't work, the, the slides, the whole thing didn't work. Uh, so I then took it the next time I did it, and I operationalized it, put it into the context and the words that they could understand and work with, and they were quite happy then to listen and take it out into the field. Whether it worked or not, I don't know. I can only assume that it did because it's a really important topic. And it's not just gender because it really, it's all of those cross-cutting themes that the UN has been dealing with and that now we're starting to deal with. I know uh, SOF has jumped all over, uh, uh, you know, children and stuff like that. Those types of initiatives are really important. Uh, we are now doing it in a more mainstream way in the conventional army as well. And Peace Support Training Center is sort of the scene to be the focal point for that. But I would argue then having trained guys that were going on GBA Plus, that were going into operations, the language there didn't resonate either. So people in the audience, 
it weren't getting it. And so I think it needs to be looked at in terms of the language that we use. And to be honest and be blunt, who's delivering it? It can't always be seen to be a female person up front delivering it. There needs to be a sense that other people buy into it as well. So how we package it and uh, the language that we use really matters. So not to say that the national policies and processes aren't valid, they absolutely are. We just need to put it into soldier speak so that people will embrace it and use it. And the other caveat that I would add is that these are really war winning strategies, dealing with the, the cultural issues, those gender issues, children, all of those things are war winning. And there's a shift that needs to be taken away from kinetic to look at these, or there needs to be a greater balance of non-kinetic issues like this taken into consideration as well. So I don't know whether that's really a question so much as an opinion that we need to take a better focus on it at an operational perspective. I totally agree with you, 100%. Uh, and, and that's why I think the leadership uh, is, is so important here, that it's not just pushed across to, you know, the the, the female in the, the unit, etc. Um, it has to be driven from the top. It has to be integrated throughout our, our normal core business um, as any other planning consideration. So I, I couldn't agree more with you. Thank you for the presentations. I found them very interesting and uh, obviously I'm a dude and I find um, gender discussions as a commander tremendously important but equally I'd say I'm not comfortable yet as I continue to be educated on this so I'll start my question with that preface. Um, equally, I would just say this one comes from my uh, recent time in Iraq where I was honored to serve with uh, about 19 other nations in the Land Component Command in Baghdad for 10 months. Um, and based on those two statements, uh, I found the discussion, particularly on gender, what I would call defensive gender operations, which is almost force protection. Look back at yourself, how can we do a better job within our armies to be inclusive uh, and to protect ourselves and equally not do things against local populations that uh, are inappropriate. My question is, do we need to think and can we think about offensive gender operations? And I think this from the perspective of Iraq and particularly taking actions against the Islamic State, who we can readily agree uh, has done horrific things to particularly women and children, uh, which I would see as a huge area to exploit within information operations and the fight for the narrative about who's winning and who should we encourage to win. Uh, I think there would be a role for offensive gender operations to identify what's happening uh, and to influence local populations, understanding that we're talking about uh, a Muslim population and that is a very sensitive area that I, I think I'd be interested in any number of comments of, number one, how do we operationalize uh, gender as an issue with uh, when fighting the narrative and particularly in a more vulnerable society that may have not completely resolved that themselves. Thank you. Uh, I actually spoke to one of the SF members here. Uh, in fact, the example uh, that I was going to use if I had enough time was uh, in regards to offensive operations. So I can't give you the specifics, but long story cut short, uh, the offensive into Mosul, particularly with, uh, in our case, the brigade that we were training, uh, the CTS brigade, uh, there were some issues with uh, the population not actually doing what we thought they were going to do. Uh, and one of the main points was that the women and children uh, were not leaving um, Mosul itself uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, but when we started to do a deep dive, particularly through our information ops, uh, we looked at uh, obviously the, the demographics, uh, where the population was, etc. But we probably didn't go into the depth of what the daily patterns of life were, particularly of the women and particularly of key influential women. Uh, sometimes we bring in our own Western bias where we think that all women in Iraq are uh, sub subservient, uh, that they're not important, but in fact that, that isn't the case. And uh, one of the areas where we were basically doing a, an IO campaign uh, was predominantly men and we weren't getting the traction uh, that was well, what was uh, the required outcome. Uh, and once we did the deep dive, we actually found uh, a large majority of the women were actually attending the university and that was one area that we hadn't targeted. So there, there were examples of 
offensive ops, not just for our own force protection. So, and I really think it's, you know, just once again that extension on uh, the human concept domain or human security operations are uh, just digging deeper into the, the gender implications as well. So that's just one example. I would only add to that that in, um, in many societies, um, women may seem invisible, but they control the household economy, and that gives them a tremendous amount of power and also of knowledge. So um, it is possible to conduct outreach um, to women and obtain a great deal of intelligence information that you would otherwise be unable to obtain. So I just point that out to any intel people in the room. Uh, my name is Harry Crawford. I'm the chaplain at CAD-TC. And within the CAD-TC formation, we are developing and working on uh, capability in its infancy, religious leader engagement, and religious area analysis. So pretty much every one of you on the panel could offer some great insight to me. One of the things that is, is challenging as we develop this is in the development of this doctrine, we're looking at, okay, who can we engage? What is the maturity level of the chaplains we need to be able to engage the other in other societies? We look at gender considerations. And particularly within the context of the military, how are we able to institute and develop a relationally based capacity, which it's very difficult to say when you're going into a relationship what the outcome is going to be before you go into it without developing, as you said, Dr. Montgomery, it together. And yet the military model says, hey, I want you to be able to say what's going to come out of this before you've actually engaged the other. So I'd be very interested to hear any of you who would like to comment, learn from your wisdom about how we can develop this capacity moving forward, especially with regards to the maturity that our chaplains are going to need, potentially the age and development that they're going to need to be able to do these things, gender considerations we should take into, into account, and how to develop a relationally based capacity within a outcome-based military. It's a great question, and um, I would say from my experience and my knowledge that um, listening is probably the most important skill that you're looking for. Um, not just hearing, but active listening about other people and other people's perspectives. Um, in terms of personality, uh, adaptability seems to be the key in enabling people to do, um, to conduct effectively operations in foreign societies. Um, Adaptability is something that can be tested for, um, and it's not necessarily connected to maturity. But I would say you've also got to find um, people who are mature enough not to feel threatened by perspectives that are different from their own, um, and who already come to their service with a little bit of wisdom based on personal experience. Yeah, and if I can just weigh in from an uh, institutional perspective of the Canadian Armed Forces, I think, you know, if we look at our Indigenous people and, and what we've recently done in the creation of a, a senior advisor to the Chaplains General, this is a sergeant in the Canadian Army that is now advising not only the Chaplain branch, but also all senior leadership on our Indigenous people's traditions. So it's not a matter of just explaining what the tradition is, but it's the meaning behind it. And I think that is, is, is key to uh, what's already been said, is that engagement with our people, like it's a basic tenet of leadership is uh, getting to know your people and promoting their welfare. And I think it's that engagement and not being afraid to explore what you don't understand and to ask questions when you don't understand and getting that message all the way down to senior leaders. If you have somebody in your unit that's different from you, embrace that and learn as much as you can about it and find out how you can uh, leverage their strengths and their differences to actually help you achieve your, your, your mission. So I think, you know, the, our approach to our Indigenous peoples is a good example and perhaps that's something we need to explore further with either the chaplaincy branch or in other aspects of the Canadian Forces. My experience suggests that there's something else going on here and that, you know, if, if, if I don't ask for directions when I'm driving, why am I going to be comfortable asking people 
for things that I don't know. So, you know, as, as an example, um, I, when I was working on my thesis 20 some years ago, I had a group of special operators that I worked with very closely. And some were going special mission units, some were going other places. And during that, during our, our classroom time, they double booked a classroom. And in come these long-haired hippie freaks, right? They, they came into our classroom because it was, it was just double booked. And we almost went to blows because you were in our classroom. And, and all of a sudden I realized we're not comfortable at all with anything different than ourselves in many ways. Military people aren't necessarily embracing of different cultures. I, you know, Lenny, to your point about you know, are, are, we, are we coddling our, it, it's our fault. We look at our own leadership structures and we ask ourselves, why do I have to have all these things approved before I can publish something? You know, I mean, all these. So I, I wonder, is our paradigm, is it much more fundamental? In other words, maybe we got the wrong kind of people in our military for the future. You know, we haven't talked at all about cyber. And, and those men and women that, that aren't anything like, you know, we're gonna hear later from Jason on, on this aspect a bit. But, but is this really the third offset? Is the third offset that we gotta do something completely different? I'll just stop there, it's, it's a more rhetorical, but you know, what are your thoughts on, on that? Do we have it wrong? Is the model wrong now that we use today? I think uh, in terms of the Canadian Armed Forces, I, I don't think we have it wrong. I think the, the aspect of what we're trying to do with the diversity strategy is pointing that we, we're looking innovative, we're looking creative, and we're trying to embrace uh, the, the next generation that's coming after us. I would say that I think although our lens has changed in how we're looking at these problems, there are limitations in how our construct is designed. Uh, so although the lens has changed, you could say the landscape hasn't. And I think, you know, when we look at our values and, and we want to bring people in, we want them to demonstrate their individual identity. We want to see them uh, be their authentic self. But there is a limit to that, sir, I would say, and that is if their individual values directly contradict our organizational values. There are certain individuals that we will not uh, accommodate within the Canadian Armed Forces. Someone who refused to take orders from a woman or refuses to take orders from uh, a Muslim member there's a limit to uh, where, where our individual values contradict our organizational values. So I, I do think we need to recognize the limitations of our ability to be fully inclusive, but that uh, does not negate our responsibilities to try to embrace diversity and become better and to be more uh, open to uh, other aspects of society if we want to maintain our relevancy. So that would be my point of view. Thank you. Anyone else? I actually have something to say, which is, um, you know, it's a real paradox when you're dealing with armed forces, not just the American one, but any armed force, because you have an organization that requires control in order to manage violence. Yet, at the same time, it also needs individuals within that system who are creative enough to find solutions. And the problem is that creative, creative people they tend to exceed the limits placed on them and the limits of control. So someone like Tom Harrison, Major Harrison, whose picture I showed at the beginning, well, he was awesome at unconventional warfare. That was one of the most successful UW campaigns in history. And yet he sucked as a staff officer. They hated his ass. They wanted him out of the army. <laughs> so it's just a problem. It's a problem that you have to deal with organizationally and you have to figure out how to manage that paradox. And there's a lot of friction there. I would, I would point out that uh, a lot of times we turned uh, to an easy solution for what you're describing. And that easy solution is turning to the bureaucracy to create another policy, to create another block of instruction. Uh, so we'll end up with like a 30 minute block of instruction on how to be innovative. <laughs> That'll be the solution. And, uh, and, and, and that, but that briefs well. And, uh, and the, what's harder to brief is that we're going to leave this to, we're going to make leaders do their job. Um, and I think that the gender stuff also goes into that. You can have all the policies in the world, yeah. but if the leader doesn't support it, no one believes it. I think exactly. that's, that was your point exactly. originally there, is that who cares? Um, and it goes to the innovation, creativity, risk. Um, if the leader really doesn't believe it, if the, reader, if the leader really believes they're being graded on how well things go, they're not gonna allow any risk. Just, just as a quick aside, many years ago we had Force 21 in the Army. 
where it was this, think creative, be new, be bold, think outside the box, and we're going to draw down the force. No one's going to take risk in that environment because you're not, it just, does, it just doesn't work. So it's just, it's just fascinating. If I can add my own two cents, I don't think it's rocket science, at least for what we're talking about in terms of the social awareness piece. Uh, you come into a social environment and you look at which variables matter. And sometimes that's gender, sometimes that's culture, sometimes that's religion. And it's the kind of analysis that's a whole lot messier than a cost-benefit analysis, and it takes practice. Uh, but you come at it with a research design like any like anything else. Um, and it's just that aha moment where all of a sudden you come to different social environments like this room and you just analyze how the different parts move uh, and then your role within it and how you may be affecting the social environment as well. First of all, I just want to make a comment uh, on General McChrystal's chart. That's the first point. It's just first compliment you on that. But I want to also, having been in the operational environment, it, for two conflicts like this. There's a second chart you got to put up there, which is uh, coalition headquarters and, <laughs> and the politics, but not only that, even in your own service politics and what agendas are being done in Congresses and your own administrations and stuff. The diagram looks the same, and then you've got the coalition commander standing in the center trying to do it with one force and dealing with the other forces. So great chart, but I put two up because if we really want to get to the challenges of command and those kind of solution sets that we put with the people on the ground, and that's not just the military, that's the, the, you know, the political entities that are playing too, that's an important piece. Um, for those that were here earlier yesterday when we brought up, we, this whole aspect of society was critical in our discussion in the Army back in 2007 on developing the human dimension. And it was, it was a hard problem, as you've put out here. And we were trying to peel back how to, how to get to all of this, because many of us had experienced it, and we're trying to collect all those pieces. And, and again, uh, I have a particular bias. I, I want to peel back to why do people think that way, which drove us into the neuro, neuroscience field. So the question I'm going to really ask you, but I want to I give you a little bit of background with it, is have any of you applied the neuroepigenetic sciences to the problems you're highlighting here? Because one of the things that we're peeling back is, and, and the question we're asking ourselves is, okay, when we get a kid from society, and, and by the way, I'm, when I'm speaking our own society, I'm also speaking those other societies when we're engaging them on where they are in, let's call it, cognitive development. Because first of all, we're all born with inherent biases, neurological biases, and then they're ingrained on us by our families, our cultures. I, I call everybody tribes, not to be derogatory, but to highlight they, each group microcosm brings a, a different piece in, whether it be to the sexes or whether it be to, to people that look different. We have natural evolutionary biases that occur in the unconscious brain on us that we have to overcome. And we had the discussion of the frontal lobes. If they aren't developed, you're, you're, you're working off what was your evolutionary biases that occur inside your brain that you have to come. Now understand they are being shaped by your parents and biases as you grow up through the generations. So the, the key is, is when do we get these kids into the forces? Okay, about 18, frontal lobes aren't developed. They're already becoming pre-wired with biases that we now one, don't know where they're coming from necessarily. So we talk about all the different societies and microcultures and, and uh, you know, in, in our, our cultures here. Others are a little more stagnant in terms of where they come from. But um, we have to deal with the reality that they're wired to think that way and we literally might have to rechange, and, and that's through your education and stuff and we get the frontal lobes to override the biases that are gonna come from the other systems. Has any of you looked, as you've addressed those problems, pulled on that science? So first of all, we really need to recognize what is the, the neurological challenges that we have to overcome because you're facing more than just information here. You're facing a, a hard, hardwired bias that you really have to rewire them, 
or at least through behavior, tell them this is not acceptable within the forces or what we're going to do. So I don't know if you, any of you have done that. If you have, I'd love to see the research or if you know people that are doing it. But I throw that out if anybody's got any uh, experience there. Unfortunately, sir, I, I think we're definitely in the infancy of, of looking into those areas where you described. And I know that's uh, something that Major General Ayer is, uh, as you mentioned uh, yesterday, is starting to explore uh, for the Canadian Armed Forces. But at this point, unfortunately, I don't have anything uh, to offer you in the way of our, our research. But do recognize the, the importance of that and, and really that being the basic element that we look at when we, we re revisit our recruiting and attraction uh, technique, too, because it affects not only how we get people in the door, but also how we can retain them within our forces. So I appreciate the, 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 uh, the comment and the question, and unfortunately we're not, we're not at the position to provide much more of a detailed answer at this point, sir. I heard three fascinating um, and yet very different perspectives on culture in the talks. The first was, oh my God, look at the weakness of the younger generation, or you could say the younger culture. Um, the second was, the Army says we have a culture of initiative and risk, but actually they're promoting people who aren't those people, so we're lying to ourselves. And the third is, look at the value of bringing in different cultures. So we heard, one, this other culture is bad, we heard, and in comparison to the second piece, which was, you know, bringing in other cultures can be tremendously valuable. So when I think about those three together, um, it takes me to a discussion I had recently with millennials in, a, in an event, and I employ millennials and I manage them, and <laughs> they would tell you, yeah, I've, I've seen that data, and actually we were talking about similar things, and they said, I live at home to take more risk with my career, uh, working for a startup and taking less money. I don't have a driver's license because financially it makes no sense I can use Uber cheaper. And so there's actually um, a total cultural disconnect, and this is a little bit bigger because in the U.S. military also we have a very strong disconnect between who's recruited into the force geographically and culturally. So um, I'd be interested to hear the panel um, reflect on these very different takes that like this culture is bad versus we can get value from other cultures. Um, what are your thoughts on how we square the circle of a, a panel that had, I'd say, quite different views? Now, um, hopefully you didn't hear me say that the millennials are bad. Um, what I was trying to say is the millennials are who they are and we've created them. And whether we like it or not, the U.S. military has a lot of tendencies that mirror U.S. society. And so we just can't stand as observers and say, have small talk about the millennials because first of all, we created them and also we have an institution that mirrors the society that created them. That's my concern. Um, so, uh, so I'm focused not on changing the millennials because I think millennials are wonderful people. And if you put them in an environment like Iraq in 2003, after the initial three weeks, where no one could tell them what to do, where they couldn't be supervised, they will rise to the occasion. Unfortunately, the tendency, the drift of our institution is to bureaucratize everything. And that's not what the millennials need. And so that's, that's my emphasis. Is that my emphasis is not on the generation. My emphasis is on the institution. We, ha we cannot mirror society and orchestrate everything for this new generation coming in because it's, they don't need that leader development. So as far as I, I think that we should just bring in as many people as possible, but we need to change the institution to matter who they are to allow them to make their own decisions, to allow them to be creative. Yeah, and just to echo those comments, I think from a Canadian Armed Forces perspective, we don't have the size of the U.S. forces, so we have to be even, it's more important for us to be able to attract uh, the, the group that uh, Dr. Wong spoke of. You know, we're, we're limited in our, our training and education. We're trying to grow our institution and we're trying to get more people. And in order to do that, we need to be attractive. And as I mentioned in my presentation, there are large groups of Canadian society that don't see the Canadian Armed Forces as a high status institution. That has to change for us to maintain our uh, institutional, uh, you know, effectiveness. Uh, and do what Canada, the government of Canada asks us to do around the world and within Canada. So we don't have the luxury of, uh, of, of being uh, choosy and uh, only picking from the, the individuals that we want society. We need to attract the best and the brightest of Canada uh, to maintain our operational effectiveness. So we need to find a way to delve through the, the complex uh, dynamics that you, that you brought up for sure.